UX for XR, designing the user experience. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Nicole Lazaro, president of Zio Design. Welcome, Nicole. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So for those of you uh, out there who may not know, uh, or for those people who may not know what Zio Design does, talk about the work that you guys do. So yeah, at Zio Design, what we do is we unlock human potential through technology and play. So we've been in business for 26 years, providing advice to leading uh, tech companies uh, inside and outside of games. So we've worked on everything from Myst and The Sims to uh, Star Wars and The Matrix, and then you know IBM and Citibank, um, all about making things technology more engaging and more fun. You gave a presentation at the Augmented World Expo on the topic of advanced user experience and user interface standards for augmented reality. Why is designing the user interface for AR harder than designing one for stationary or mobile computing devices? Right. Yeah, it's it's a really it's an amazing topic. <clears throat> you know, spatial computing is completely different than uh, designing for a flat screen on one hand, or say designing for uh, you know one of these, which is this is the Oculus Rift. Yeah, this so this is VR. Instead, it's, uh, it's because, it's really because when you're designing a pair for essentially of sunglasses, so this is the Magic Leap on one hand, which has a bunch of cameras in the front, and this is the Bose, the new Bose AR, which is uh, an audio augmented reality. So with these sort of um, technologies, the real world is a big part of the experience. So it is like just putting on a set of, you know, uh, your computer, you put on your computer like a pair of sunglasses, essentially. And now I see the real world, uh, and uh, here, a virtual environment, in case of Bose, well, in the case of Magic Leap or HoloLens, I then see computers projected, computer, computer projections all over the, you know, the, the real world. Uh, and so what's fun is like we found this with uh, designing uh, for Follow the White Rabbit, we have this special chapter that happens in Aladdin's Cave of Wonders, which is like my favorite story of the Arabian Nights. And you're surrounded by, we basically fill the room around you, the real room around you, with these enormous gem covered trees. And you have to navigate in your real living room uh, around these trees, touching nothing of the uh, no, none of the gems, until you find the magic lamp and grab that. Then you have the projection of the lamp, and you can gather as many gems as you want to. Now, uh, what makes this fun is, of course, you're you're navigating around your real living room, but you're also navigating around your uh, these projected uh, trees that are growing up all around you. And so, what, what's interesting about this type of augmented experience is that it is in stereo. It's on your, it's on your, it's on your face. You can actually see them, and then the the graphics need to respond to the real world. So I would turn a coffee table into a pile of gold coins. I might uh, put the you know hang um, hang hang vines you know from the ceiling. Turn a lamp into an obelisk. You know those sorts of things uh, by you know the miracle of you know computer vision and some you know AI. Uh, and so it's the integration of the real world with the, with uh, a computer uh, computer graphics, the virtual world together. That's what really makes uh, augmented reality challenging from a UI perspective. So, what are some of the rules that a VR user interface must follow? Well, for uh, augmented reality uh, interfaces, you really want to use what's there. You have to use what's there. Uh, you can just project a um, a simple, you know. VR projection around you, three dimensions, and not respect, not respond to anything in the real world. But then it doesn't feel right. It's kind of like playing Pokemon Go. You have the little character on your your little Weeble on your salad, um, but it doesn't really, you know, sit there and it doesn't eat any of the lettuce. In AR, we really expect the Weeble to be able to, you know, climb on the table up over the up over the plate in your fork, and then grab a cherry tomato and run away with it. <laughs> Um, so I mean, I think that would be, or maybe it's a virtual cherry tomato that they put on there and then, you know, to make it all work technically, but that's the kind of experience. It's that real world and the virtual world coming together. So you want to use, uh, basically you have to use, you know, incorporate the real world. You know, you don't want to, you want to, and you don't want to replace it. So you want to augment it. Don't replace it. Uh, you want to leave enough space for the user, the, the, the player to interact. So don't crowd them so much that they are, you know, kind of clockwork orange style that everything is just beaming right into your brain and you can't move, you can't do anything, you can't turn it off. Um, you know, so a training video that completely took over your virtual world, you're making sandwiches and you can't look away from it because it's always headlocked, you know, that's not going to be, that's not going to be good. And don't, nobody wants to watch training videos 24 seven or at least, you know, or even nine to five. So you've got to give people respect um, and allow them to control what they see. 
uh, and then you want to you want the real world. Uh, we need to have the the AI respond to what we found is that we want to again like on the idea of using what's there. So it was salad in one case in our game with Aladdin. We wanted to you know not have like a controller in your hand all the time because you know it's just that you want your hands. You want to use what's there. So what does everybody have? Most people, not everybody, but most people have hands. We got a good. Uh, a good contingent of people that come with hands. And so for augmented reality, we don't want this mouse situation, we really want the, your fingers. So for Aladdin, what we did is we actually created finger spells. So you have a very simple th way of uh, interacting with the object. So you grab a virtual gem, for example. You can create different magic spells by you know, making gestures with your hands. And then that causes uh, some things to come, come to life. You can pick up the lamp, you can move a lock. You know, but again, I need to. I want to be able to like actually grab my hand and have the have the game understand that as a grab. And now I'm gonna you know grab this lever and pull it towards me. What I'm holding on is nothing. It's just the virtual one, you know. <laughs> but we we could pull it towards us. Um, and we tried in in the development of it lots of different you know lots of different ways of interacting. And one thing that we found, which was interesting, one problem we found is that many of these systems like Hololens and Magic Leap come with uh, gesture recognizers as part of the SDK. And so you might be able to recognize a thumbs up or, you know, with HoloLens, you know, the pinch or, you know, you know, some okay sign or something, you know, or a grab or something or a fist or a fist that way. Uh, but there for, it's not a, uh, it's not a, it's interesting that it's not a semantic language that's as flexible or as fluid we found as, you know, going with a mouse and dropping down on a menu and clicking, you know, print, uh, just making the gesture for print it's not the same. First of all, we have very limited gestures, right, um, that, we, that we can have. And the idea, it's very awkward to go this, and then this, and then wait for the recognizer, and then wait for the recognizer, when in fact, what I wanna do is this, right, and make my little finger magic spells, and then, and then poof, something happens. So the staccato kind of gesture, recognize the gesture and move on, just really didn't work. And so we're using those as anchors, but then providing feedback so that, um, so that the, the players, uh, uh, the, although the gestures are recognizing the notes, if you will, like you can imagine a, uh, a musical staff and all these gestures are running underneath it, right? So although I'm hitting all the notes, right, I'm also creating these, um, these motions in the, uh, in the world, uh, you know, particle effects and that sort of thing. So it feels much, much more gestorial. And then the next one is, of course, to actually uh, is actually just to go ahead and use the bones or create our own script to you know identify the bones and the fingers and a rig you know a fate, um, that models the hand and then use you know use uh, use a more fluid system in order to get in order to get spells. Um, when I worked on uh, I worked on three of the Mist series and with Mist Five, what we found um, this was we were doing user user you know player feedback for them. And it's a hard thing to even just recognize a square, you know, drawn on a, you know, drawn with a mouse. Uh, in, in the virtual world, in AR and augmented reality, you have depth, right? So that, that task of drawing a square can have like some Z into it, right? And then is that a circle or a square from what, what person's perspective? So it's quite a bit harder to, um, to generate, you know, to generate, um, you know, gestures. Uh, but we think that, you know, pinch and drag is going to be replaced kind of click and drag. I think that's going to work really well in the virtual environment. And we found so like with we just tested um, we just tested our game, uh, the Aladdin's Cave and Follow the White Rabbit at the uh, UN Global Wim Women's Film Festival. And what we found there is that we got like a 69 NPS score because people could be like in that cave and, you know, it's all around them, audio, and these beautiful gems. And then they could just grab as many as they wanted to. And it was fun to kind of walk around, you know, uh, walk around and try and navigate the path. That, that real world, you know, emission, that interaction is a lot more satisfying than clicking and dragging on a menu. What are, what are some of the ethical issues at play in designing uh, a VR user experience? Well, I think if you look at um, the, they, these things, uh, in order to work, they gather a lot of data. So uh, a augmented reality headset, that is going to project onto your eyes. So there's a light field. On this case, for Magic Leap, there's two. Um, they're sandwiched into each lens. Um, so you have a total of like four. But uh, they have to have all these cameras. And the, uh, the Quest, which is really, is really more a VR system also, they've got four cameras. And so you're gathering like all of this data. What do you do with it? And there are cameras on the inside too. And so the, uh, what we, the opportunity is, of course, we can interact with the world uh the challenge and then we can also sense people's emotions 
And then the uh, ethical, one of the, kind of there are two sort of ethical. One is what do we do with that data? So if we know someone's emotional in a certain way, uh, just like a social media platform, you know, they could, they could feed you more content to make you more upset or more, you know, angry or more, you know, polarized uh, or, you know, more desiring, you know, perfume and then sell you an ad for perfume type of thing. So we have that on one hand, but I think more importantly is that this is such an intimate, uh, an intimate experience because it is like literally worn on your face. Uh, this, of course, is just audio, but when you when they get, you know, the visuals on here, like North, North has a set of glasses that look like this. It's so, it's so intimate that uh, some other psychological things uh, are really come into play. It's kind of like what I, I like to call it um, sort of uh, forced bystander syndrome, if you will, because you get all this super emotional content uh, bringing in. So you might be in clouds over Cedro or seeing a, um, a Holocaust, you know, reenactment on your living room, like in, a, in like a, a newspaper, you know, article. You might see it being reenacted on your coffee table. Uh, it can create a lot more emotions because it's in, in 3D and it feels like you're really there. And so, uh, but then if the, the, if the experience doesn't provide the context, which is another important design principle, context, if the experience, uh, if the augmented experience does not provide context for you to express your emotions or work through your emotions or share your emotions or act on your emotions, or if it, doesn't, it isn't shown in a context that allows you to do that, then you're going to get these very intense experiences, one after the other after the other. Uh, and that's where you get depression, right? You, you're, it's like that forced inaction because like I make you feel really strongly and then I'm not going to let you do anything about it. When one of the one of the more important roles that emotions have is they uh, when they get triggered is to increase motivation to take action to you know you know correct something in the world that's wrong or maybe celebrate you know when things are going well. Uh, so we've got these these technology platforms that are a lot more powerful, and we want to make sure that we've got them. We're using them well so that people aren't you know we aren't increasing the problem we have. Right now, with you know, there's an epidemic with depression and the opioid crisis and all of that. Uh, so, yeah, so that, I think that's that's a really important. And I think we need to fund enough. We need to fund enough experiences that are actually on the therapy side, on the ability to make have, give people the tools to uh, make themselves better. I think that's an important ethical concern too. The ethics of of finance. There you go. Nicole Lazaro, president of Zio Design. If somebody wants to understand this better, maybe they want to find out more about your work, Nicole, how can they do that? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Nicole at Nicole Lazaro, uh, or you can uh, go to our website, which is uh, Zio Design, xeodesign.com. All right. Thanks again for joining us. And if you guys want to find me and more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.